Hello and welcome to our second video for unit zero. This one is going to be all about chapter two. And the first thing that I want you to do for this chapter is the same as last time. Go to page 36. This is the chapter two core case study. And it's going to talk about a controlled experiment within a forest that um, helped to link the relationship between trees and tree cover and erosion. So with that, what I want you to do is determine what an independent and dependent variable um, are, what the difference is between them. And if you don't know that already, obviously, and then with that, I want you to determine which is which within the field study. Okay, what's the independent variable? What's the dependent variable in that specific experiment? Okay, and then with the information that you got yesterday, you should be able to uh, be able to figure out what a couple of ecosystem services that an intact forest can provide for us. Um, well, with that, Let's get into the first part of chapter two, and that's the scientific method, something that has been drilled into your head for many, many years. And it's all about just finding some sort of phenomenon, maybe a, a, even a problem out there in the world and doing some research, figuring out more about it, uh, figure out what you want to investigate and then actually developing an experiment and investigating it and getting data, right? Whether that's observations, whether that's um, some quantitative data, some numbers. And with that, you can use that to um, try to explain what is going on. So your hypothesis will um, try to answer that question using the data that you received. And then um, it's really important that this experiment can be repeated by you, by other scientists, so that it can be tested over and over and over again. And if the results are the same many, many times, then that can be something that will become a theory or a law, right? So things like theories, um, it's not just something that we came up with without any proof. A theory is something that is backed by a lot of data. All right, so now I want you to go and read the article on page 39. It's about Easter Island, and there were hypotheses about what happened on Easter Island with the population um, really decreasing by a lot um, that were put forth and accepted for a long time. But then um, these other scientists, Hunt and Lippo, they went and they did more research, and they actually... Um, Kind of figured out that maybe what was said before wasn't true and they found data that could support some different hypotheses um, so what i want you to get from this article is uh, why it's important for scientists to continue to um, do research and test hypotheses because sometimes new information comes out and we need to be flexible and um, dynamic in making hypotheses um, I provided you with a link to the Kahoot as well as the quizzes. You can re review these chemistry concepts on your own with those games. If you want a bigger review, you can go and read these pages 40 through 47 in the textbook. Energy. So energy is going to be one of the units this year. So it's a very big topic um, and energy it can be kinetic in that it moves or potential in that the position or um, uh, shape of something determines its potential energy, its stored energy, okay? So kinetic energy is like this electromagnetic radiation that we have here, these waves that are moving at the speed of light, okay? So that's what makes it kinetic, but the shorter the waves, the more frequency there is, the more energy, energy that radiation has. So gamma rays, x-rays, they have a lot more energy than say at the end of, other end of this spectrum, like the radio waves have less. So getting hit by gamma rays is gonna be a lot more dangerous than getting hit by radio waves, okay? Um, visible light, I mean, that's really important. I mean, that's a lot of the sunlight that we're getting as well as UV radiation from the sun too. Wind is also kinetic. That's the movement of the air. 
what we see here, this is water behind a dam. And when we put a dam in a river, we're taking water that was moving and we're stopping it from moving, which means that there is gonna be a lot of stored potential energy back here behind the dam that will, um, when allowed to move, help to provide us with some energy. Okay, so these are just a few examples of energy here. Now that you have a good understanding of renewable and non-renewable from the first chapter, I want you to explain what the difference between renewable and non-renewable energy is and list a couple of examples of each if you can. Um, but you can also go in your book and figure that out uh, if you don't know that already. Okay, first law of thermodynamics and the second law of thermodynamics. The first law, energy is not created or destroyed. It can only be converted from different forms from energy that already exists. So we're not just magically creating energy out of nowhere. Energy comes from somewhere, whether it's stored in chemical bonds in fossil fuels or um, coming as electromagnetic radiation from the sun. Uh, we can use it for other purposes, but it comes from somewhere. All right, so a good example of this is photosynthesis, where plants are taking the electromagnetic radiation from the sun, converting it into stored energy in the bonds of glucose molecules, which can then be used by the plant or eaten by an animal where either of those organisms can use it through cellular respiration to break down those bonds, to use that energy for other purposes. Second law, energy that is converted from one form to another becomes a lower quality energy. So in a lot of cases, that means that it is going from maybe like gasoline to heat, right? We can use heat for things and we do use heat for things, but a lot of times, heat is released uh, as a waste product. Okay, um, now with that knowledge of energy, I want you to figure out what the uh, term energy efficiency means. You probably already have an idea, but uh, figure that out. And why is it going to be an important component of our study of environmental science? So hopefully you can answer these on your own. And if not, go ahead and check it out in your book in chapter two. All right, um, we're gonna talk about what a system is and a couple different feedback systems here. So a system is just a bunch of things that work together, right? They interact in a way like in a human body, all your organs working together to perform uh, a bunch of different functions that help to keep you alive. A cell, very similar, right? Um, all those organelles working together to keep that cell alive, to do its function. TV set with all that, uh, all those wires and other components that help to show you a fun TV show, um, as well as an economy. All right, so there are things that go into these systems, they're used by that system, and then there are outputs. So think of the human body, what goes in? Well, oxygen, uh, food, water, and what do we use it for? Well, we use it for energy. We use the water for a bunch of different things. We use the oxygen for cellular respiration. And what comes out? Well, we have to urinate, we have to defecate. Um, so those are our outputs of matter. Uh, energy, well, we use that energy from the food that we eat, um, but then we don't use all of it. So some of it, it gets released as heat. Okay. All right. So with those systems, there can be uh, feedback. So we can have a positive feedback loop or a negative feedback loop. And basically these are going to influence changes that happen in the system. A positive feedback loop is where we continue to see the change occur more and more and more. Negative feedback loop, the change is happening, but eventually it is going to stop. All right, so what we have here is kind of like, I, I like this diagram as it looks like a spiral, right? So this is a positive feedback loop. We have a forest. What happens when we cut down some of the trees? Well, when we cut down some of the trees, that is going to expose a bunch of soil. Uh, that soil is going to erode, take away nutrients with it. It's gonna make it more difficult for the trees 
to uh, grow and thrive there. So more trees will die, which means that there will be more erosion, more nutrient loss, which means that more trees will die, less can grow back and so on and so on. So that forest, just from cutting down some trees um, could be really negatively impacted if it continues to be allowed to occur, okay? So it means that this one right here is negative feedback. And the example that is given is a thermostat in a home. So as a house gets warmer, the thermostat is going to detect that and you know, turn the AC on. Um, or in this case, it says the furnace goes off. Um, but then what happens if the house cools down too much? You know, Maybe it's the winter time. So then the furnace is going to be turned back on by that thermostat. Okay, the last thing that we're gonna do in this chapter is dimensional analysis. This is gonna be very, very important for the one FRQ that we do this year that has math in it. So make sure that you understand how to do this. I'm gonna go and walk you through a few examples, All right? So this is really just um, multiplication and division, but you just have to know how to set up the problems, okay? Um, there are gonna be conversions between metric units. And the blue here is really detailing what is needed to be known in chemistry. Um, here in environmental science, I would say Mila and Seni are the little ones that you need to know, not so much these ones. And I'd say Kilo, Mega, and Giga, those three you should know as well, All right? So basically what this is telling us is that, okay, we have, I'll use meter as an example, one meter. Well, one meter is equal to uh, zero point, uh, I'm sorry, one milliliter is equal, sorry, millimeter is equal to 0 0.001 meters. Okay. One meter is equal to one meter. One milliliter is 0 0.001 millimeter. What about a kilometer? Well, one kilometer is going to be equal to 1000 meters. A megameter is going to be equal to 1 million meters. Um, if you need any help with this, just let me know. But these are the conversion factors that we will use. All right. So I'm going to use one of those as an example. Okay. So we're going to convert 10 meters to millimeters. So I'm going to go back here and we see millimeters down here. So we have one meter uh, and 0 0.001 here. So that means that a millimeter is equal to 0 0.001 meters. So how are we going to do that? Um, this is what we know. This is what we're trying to figure out. So the conversion factor, one meter is equal to 1,000 millimeters. That should be easier, right? So a meter stick has 1,000 ticks on it. The, all those ticks are equal to one millimeter. Um, so one meter is equal to 1,000 millimeters. There are 1,000 millimeters in one meter. So what we wanna do is we wanna set up 10 meters and we're gonna set it up as a fraction. So 10 meters over one, just to make it easier on ourselves. This is means the same exact thing as what we have here. And we're gonna multiply this by our conversion factor. So we have to put one on top of the other. So we need to convert from this to the millimeters. So that means that we need to have meters uh, if we have meters here on the top of our fraction, we need over here in the conversion factor to put meters on the opposite um, side. So meters is going to go on the bottom. Okay, so 1,000 millimeters goes on top. One meter goes on the bottom. The meter is going to cancel out, and it's going to give us millimeters in the numerator as our unit. Okay, so 10 over 1, 1,000 over 1. Those ones we don't have to worry about. So we need to take 10 times 1,000. That gives us 10,000. And since the meters cancel out, that leaves us with millimeters as our unit. So that means that 10 meters, after multiplying by this conversion factor that we know here, is equal to one, sorry, 10,000 millimeters. All right, let's do another one. Well, I'm sorry, before, before we move on, um, how do we know that this is correct. Well, if this is true, that means that if um, I were to um, take either of these, let's say I take 1000 millimeters and divide it on both sides, I had to put it over here, that's gonna be equal to one. So this is the same as this. So that means that if I put one over the other, that's equal to one. 
okay? So that means that we're taking this, multiplying it by the conversion factor. All we're doing is multiplying it by one, but that's helping us to change our units from one to another. And we're gonna do the same thing in the next one. So now we wanna convert minutes into hours. We got 38 minutes. We need to figure out how many hours that is. Um, so hopefully you know that there are 60 minutes in one hour. So we're gonna use that as our conversion factor, all right? One hour is equal to 60 minutes, meaning that one hour over 60 minutes is equal to one, or if we were to do it the other way, 60 minutes over one hour is equal to one as well, okay? So if we flip that, since it, this is equal to one, if we flip it, it's still equal to one. All right, so 38 minutes over one, multiply it, apply it by the conversion factor. In this case, we don't have to worry about flipping it. Hours already on top. That's what we want. The thing that we want to cancel out, we'll put it on the bottom since it's up here in the numerator to begin with. So um, 38 minutes times one, still 38 divided by 60. The math is going to come out to 0.63. The minutes cancel out. The only units that we have are hours. All right, our last one, inches to centimeters. This is not as commonly known in terms of a conversion factor. So we need, we have 20 inches. We need to figure out how many centimeters that is. So the, the conversion factor that I gave you, I put here one inch is equal to 2.54 centimeters. Um, again, we can put one on top of the other. It's gonna be equal to one. So when we set it up, we got 20 inches over one multiply that by our conversion factor. In this case, we want centimeters on top. So we'll have to flip this, which is totally fine since this is equal to one, regardless of whether it's um, like this or flipped. Okay, so 2.54 centimeters on top, one inch on the bottom, because we got to cancel out the inches. Um, this one will take 20 times the 2.54 since they're both in the numerator and we get 50.8 centimeters. All right, so those are the three sample problems. I hope that that was helpful for you and um, you'll be able to complete the worksheet that I gave you for this, as well as for rule of 70 from the previous video. If you have any questions, just email me and um, I'll get back to you as soon as I can. Thanks for watching.